Thank you very much. I, I hope I, I, uh, you can hear me uh, clearly. Uh, thank you so much, first of all, for inviting me for this uh, uh, nice conference. Uh, I'm very excited. You guys have lots of speakers, and uh, that's uh, probably my first uh, experience of uh, kickstarting uh, such a great conference. And uh, the topic of my uh, presentation will be on uh, reinforcement learning, and it's in verse. Uh, I, 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 that's how I uh, put it shortly, but actually it's about two uh, related topics called uh, reinforcement learning and inverse reinforcement learning. And I'm going to be talking about uh, the applications for quantitative finance. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, very briefly, what uh, what are reinforcement learning and what is inverse reinforcement learning? So uh, I, I, I put two, these two funny pictures here. Uh, to emphasize a couple of points uh, that will be uh, <clears throat> important for this presentation. So first, uh, very high level uh, bullet points. Uh, these are my personal reasons why uh, I like reinforcement learning. Uh, first, uh, reinforcement learning implements one of the uh, my, my most favorite principles, uh, which is uh, called the first Vapnik principle. Uh, Vapnik, if you uh, don't know, is a creator, very famous person, is a creator uh, of support vector machines. And he once uh, stated that one should avoid solving more difficult intermediate problems when solving uh, a target problem. And uh, to, to me, uh, reinforcement learning is exactly uh, one implementation of this idea in a sense that I will explain later. Uh, but briefly, and the, 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 the meaning is that reinforcement learning focuses on the, on the target problem, which is the problem of optimizing your actions, like how you act optimally. And uh, intermediate problem is the problem of forecasting the future. So what did we do in finance most of the time? Uh, most of our time we solve intermediate problems. We're trying to build predictive models and then act on them. But that's not the only possible paradigm and reinforcement learning offers a way to do it differently. <clears throat> so that's thing number one. And thing number two is that reinforcement learning incorporates the feedback loop. Uh, so what is the feedback loop? Feedback loop is when actions of an agent uh, may impact the environment. So, so by doing something, you can uh, influence the future. It's like butterfly effect from sci-fi. Now, uh, this is uh, when humans look at, at uh, robots, but uh, also uh, you may take another uh, look at this problem and uh, uh, take a viewpoint of robots and ask uh, yourself as a robot, uh, what methods uh, you should uh, use to achieve human-like performance. In other words, should robot, you, robots use uh, reinforcement learning or rather inverse reinforcement learning? And that's a very good question, actually. I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more later about that. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, before switching to that, I, I want to um, show you uh, chapters from our book, uh, which are uh, related to the topics uh, that I'm going to be uh, covering. Uh, so this is our recent book, uh, uh, which we published this year. And few chapters in this book um, talking about uh, reinforcement learning and inverse reinforcement learning. So I would refer you to all technical details to the book. And But instead, what I'll try to do today is to give you some sort of a high level uh, overview of uh, what these uh, things are. So let me start with reinforcement learning. In reinforcement learning, you typically have uh, two uh, sides to the game, two players, uh, if you wish. Uh, one of them is the agent and another one is the environment. And uh, agent and environment are involved in multi-step uh, interaction. So, so interaction between them extends over many steps. Uh, it's a multi-step decision-making process in which at each time step, uh, the same thing happens over and over again. So what's happening here? The each time step T, the agent receives information about the state of the environment, um, which is shown here. Um, so the, this information is encoded in some sort of a vector S, so it, it, has, it can have multiple components. Um, and uh, Upon receiving this information, the agent acts on the environment. So there are actions, certain actions. So for trading, it will be, for quantitative finance, it will be trading, changes of positions. 
And this is uh, a, 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 expressed as some sort of uh, action uh, AT, which can also be multidimensional. So it can be a scalar or it can be a, a vector. <clears throat> now, uh, upon acting on the environment, uh, uh, the agent receives reward. So reward is the ultimate objective of what agent does. And uh, the objective is to maximize the total reward from taking actions over the whole course of interactions with the environment. Uh, now, uh, so these are three uh, important uh, um, uh, variables in, in, this, uh, in this problem. But also there is one more which is a uh, very important uh, effect. And this is this feedback loop that I just mentioned. Uh, so this feedback loop, the presence of this feedback loop is the key uh, difference between reinforcement learning and, um, and other uh, areas of machine learning, such as supervised learning or unsupervised learning. It never in, uh, happens in, 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 in supervised or unsupervised learning. Nevertheless, uh, in reinforcement learning, there is a provision you don't have to have it if you don't want, or, or there is no reason uh, uh, for, for this to be. But uh, there is a provision for, for this effect. So whenever the agent acts on the environment with actions A, uh, uh, receiving reward RT, uh, it may have the, the, the effect of change of the environment encoded in this feedback loop. Now, uh, uh, and, and there are many uh, different uh, uh, cases of the environment that can be observable or partial observable, stochastic or deterministic, episodic or sequential, etc. Um, but this is the general scheme. And what this uh, framework uh, tries to achieve is uh, a more practical ways uh, of, um, of solving uh, very classical problems of optimal control which were pioneered by Bellman in, in the uh, 50s uh, under the name of dynamic programming. So reinforcement learning is the modern approach to uh, solve exactly the same type of problems, which are not solvable beyond simple cases in the, in the classical approach. So this is the general framework for reinforcement learning and specifically for finance. Uh, you have almost the same thing. So you can look uh, at typical financial problems such as portfolio management as a reinforcement learning task in which you have the agent being the portfolio manager and the environment being the market. Um, and uh, as before, uh, the, the task amounts to sequential decision making by doing trades in the portfolio um, uh, and uh, rebalancing portfolio in, in, in different ways. And obviously, because, uh, as we said, the problem extends over multiple steps. It also involves planning and forecasting into the future. So this is where your predictive models, if you want to use predictive models here, there are other ways where, uh, which do not force you to do this. Um, but uh, uh, this involves some sort of a planning and forecasting into the future. Uh, now, a very important thing, which I mentioned before, this feedback loop. Um, so feedback loop is very natural uh, uh, in, in, in this sort of applications. If you think of a large uh, trader, uh, a large institutional trader that uh, does uh, so many trades that it moves the market. And in, clearly in this case, the market impact effect, what we call in finance, is the one of the manifestations of this feedback loop. Uh, so, so this is the very uh, classical, uh, uh, like this is the setting which fits very naturally into the framework of reinforcement learning. Now, there is another uh, very interesting twist of this whole uh, formulation, and uh, this is called inverse reinforcement learning. So, what's the difference between reinforcement learning and inverse reinforcement learning? Uh, I, we have again the same uh, diagram, which is uh, uh, almost the same as before. Uh, uh, there is only one difference, uh, and this difference is that now the rewards are not absorbed. So imagine that you have a data set. Uh, these things are normally done historically. You have a data set collected from um, actions of, of some agent. It can be either human agent or artificial agent. Um, and the data amounts to stored values of, of prices or whatever else 
additional intimation is uh, in this vector, uh, right? So for each time uh, t, you have uh, this uh, vector of state, uh, including prices, etc. Uh, maybe some macro factor variables like portfolio information. Everything is in here. Uh, now, uh, and uh, the, the trades uh, amount to some changes of the positions in the portfolio shown here. Uh, so these two elements are the same as before. The, the, the difference is that right now you don't have observed rewards. So you observe some behavior and you don't understand why agents, uh, uh, agent, the agent took uh, certain actions and not others. So you have to, your task is to rationalize the uh, behavior of, of an agent. And clearly this is a very, very general formulation. It's of, uh, uh, there is lots of interest in, in problems like that, not only in finance, but also in other areas, for example, in marketing. So if, uh, 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 if you are a marketer, uh, or, or, or uh, otherwise want to sell your product to the clients, clearly, if you understand the motives and the rationale of, of those clients, it will be easier for you to sell uh, them uh, services which fit better to their needs. And the way to understand it, the way to understand the, uh, the preferences uh, of, of your clients is via uh, using these methods. Uh, now, coming back specifically to finance, uh, uh, one simple example where such approach would be uh, very useful is uh, when you uh, trade. So in finance, you most of trades are done through exchange. And, the, uh, and this thing uh, adds some complexity to this whole formulation. I'll talk a bit later about that. Uh, but in, in more simple case, when you trade uh, not uh, anonymously through exchange, but rather with a counterparty, uh, so you trade with another portfolio manager in this case, uh, in, in, for this formulation, uh, <clears throat> for this setting, this formulation would be, uh, uh, could be adjusted, uh, it could be applied in a very straightforward way because here you have an agent uh, which, who, who trades with you and your task is uh, by observing those traits to understand the, the utility function, what is called. So utility function is the, is the quantification of desirability of different actions by the agent. So if you observe actions of the agent, uh, in this approach, you assume that those actions in, are intended to maximize uh, some function. Uh, and this function is called an economics utility function. And reinforcement learning calls it uh, uh, a reward function. So, <clears throat> so the, the objective is to maximize the total reward, which is obtained by summing up rewards from individual time steps. All right. Uh, now, um, so uh, now I want to say a few general comments about uh, how we can start uh, applying reinforcement learning and inverse reinforcement learning to problems in finance. Uh, so, uh, so to reiterate what I said before, the, the reinforcement learning is, the, is a modern paradigm for uh, solving very classical uh, problems of optimal control uh, in, in real world. Uh, and uh, this approach is, uh, uh, is generally data-driven and sometimes even model-free. Uh, now, uh, this, uh, uh, we, we've, we've seen lots of uh, exciting progress in these areas in, um, in, uh, in, in tech fields such as uh, video games and robotics. And uh, people uh, at uh, such uh, places as uh, DeepMind or OpenAI um, made uh, very impressive progress in, in uh, certain areas of uh, um, uh, uh, reinforcement learning. Uh, there is something uh, called deep RL, deep reinforcement learning, which is essentially a combination of methods uh, uh, and ideas from reinforcement learning with uh, deep uh, learning, which gives you uh, lots of flexibility in ways to uh, uh, parameterize different functions uh, which arise in this problem. So in supervised learning, you build neural net uh, to have uh, some sort of a classifier or, or nonlinear regression. 
Uh, but in reinforcement learning, you use uh, the same uh, technology to represent functions which are relevant for reinforcement learning, such as value function or policy. And I'll explain a bit later what these functions are. Uh, but before uh, going there, uh, I want to uh, talk a little bit about differences between, um, between uh, problems that uh, people solve in video games and robotics and problems that people face in finance. So <laughs> in finance, uh, we, uh, sorry, in, in uh, video games and robotics, uh, typically uh, researchers have uh, plenty of data. Uh, they have uh, data with a very uh, low noise. And uh, typically the dimensionality of the uh, action space or state action space is, is rather low. So it's typically intense. Uh, now, none of these uh, conditions is normally the case for applications in, um, uh, in finance. So in finance, we don't have uh, plenty of data unless you deal with intraday trading or high frequency trading. Uh, but uh, instead, uh, you have tons of noise. So it's mostly about noise. Uh, the whole finance is mostly about noise. And um, also the dimensionality of the action spaces normally is very high in hundreds, sometimes in thousands. So, uh, so all this makes it very clear that uh, RL for finance is very different from uh, RL in Atari games. So the question is how we should proceed in this case. And uh, here we have uh, um, some list of recommendations based on uh, our experience and understanding of how exactly we should proceed. So the first recommendation is to avoid the temptation to start with the off-shelf uh, deep RL libraries, even though they are available and even though it might be the first thing that comes to one's mind. Uh, let's just take this, uh, change the you know input data, change the format and let it run. Okay, so uh, chances are that it will not work or if it, if it, if it works, it will not work as, as expected. Uh, the related recommendation would be to avoid the temptation to start with deep learning altogether and instead start with some simple models that avoid black box architectures and uh, instead admit uh, hopefully semi-analytical solutions uh, in terms of linear algebra and convex optimization. Uh, and uh, this thing is not always uh, possible but it is possible in certain cases and the key here is that this is only doable if you have simple enough models of the agent reward. Um, uh, so, uh, and I'll explain a bit later what I mean by simple enough. Uh, but essentially, uh, the, the statement is that uh, this program of reducing everything to a bunch of linear algebra and simple optimization, and even avoiding altogether any, any neural nets, uh, all this is, is feasible and doable uh, if your reward function is a quadratic function of uh, states and action. Uh, that's the statement. Uh, and and uh, in certain cases, you can uh, do little more complex things, but you will quickly run out of luck. And uh, for more complex uh, reward function, you will need have to use, uh, you will have to use uh, 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 neural nets or some other ways to uh, do function approximation. But nevertheless, the point is that uh, it's not always needed and definitely you should not start with that. You, you should only move to there uh, after you uh, understood the previous case. Uh, now, here's a little bit of, uh, of uh, it's not even math, but rather like notations, like how these things are organized. Um, so the, 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 the main, uh, uh, workhorse for uh, this sort of problems is the is the formalism called Markov, Markov decision processes, uh, which is shown here. So what happens here is that Markov decision process is described by a uh, sequence uh, of uh, states, which I uh, mentioned before, uh, which belong to some set of states, and this set can be discrete or continuous. And you have those sections which also belong in some set, which is a, a, a set of either discrete or continuous actions. Uh, now, uh, a few uh, key uh, elements of this scheme are transition probabilities. So these are probabilities of transition from some previous state ST uh, given action AT to some new state S uh, sub T plus one. And uh, <clears throat> 
the reward function, which is the objective of this snoring, as we mentioned, is, uh, is uh, some function that maps uh, the, 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 those two sets. Uh, so it's a function of a state and action uh, producing a number. Uh, now, uh, one more element is the discount factor. So discount factor is something that enters here. Instead of optimizing just the sum of uh, all future reward, you optimize discounted sum, which is shown here and the full expression is here. And the mean of this discount is more or less the same as discounted finance. So you value immediate rewards more than you value uh, rewards in the distant future. Uh, now, uh, how you solve this problem? The problem is solved by specifying, uh, so this is again the goal. Uh, now, uh, because as we said, the environment change and the uh, rewards refer to points in the future, you cannot directly optimize this thing because uh, it's stochastic. But what you can do instead is to optimize the expected value of this thing, uh, which is shown here, right? So, so all these uh, terms in the sum refer to some future dates and therefore you optimize the, the, the expectation, the present value of this sum. And the way you do it by choosing what is called policy. So policy is exactly your uh, prescription how you act. So given the state, the policy tells you what actions you should take. And there are two sorts of policy. One of them uh, is uh, what is called deterministic policies. So in this case, uh, you have a deterministic prescription of what you have to do, and that's the function. Uh, so every time you find, or the agent finds itself in the certain state, it will act the same way. Uh, as opposed to that, there are other uh, policies, uh, other type of policies, which is called uh, stochastic policy. And in this case, the, this function is not a function anymore, but it is rather probability distribution. So you have some variability and the, in general, the, 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 an agent will act differently uh, in different states of mind, uh, states of, uh, of the world. Now, uh, so in, in the book, we have uh, lots of examples and probably the simplest possible example of reinforcement learning in a kind of financial uh, like setting would be this example, which is the, our adaptation of a very famous uh, problem from uh, great book by Sutton and Barto on reinforcement learning uh, where they introduced this cliff walking problem uh, which we restated and rephrased uh, uh, as financial cliff walking. So what is this thing? It's a, it's a, it's a very simple uh, um, problem in which uh, you, it's, it's actually basically stripped down of all the complexities uh, like there is no stochasticity, there is very low dimensional uh, state and action space, etc. So what's happening here? Imagine that you have an agent that has to uh, uh, has a very simple task uh, of uh, maintaining a bank account. So x axis is the time uh, discretized in, in number of steps, uh, something like twelve steps here, and the y axis is the balance on a bank account also discretized for simplicity into four different values. Uh, now the task of the, uh, of the agent is to, is to maintain uh, this uh, uh, bank account. Um, there are a few, uh, few constraints here. One constraint is that, uh, uh, so at each point in time, uh, let's say the agent is at this point in time with this amount of uh, uh, money on the account. Uh, now, the, what uh, the agent can do in the next step, it can uh, do nothing. So in this case, it will move here to this cell. It can add uh, to the uh, account. And in this case, it will, it will move to this cell or it can withdraw from the uh, account that in this case it would move to this cell. Okay, so this is what happens if the agent is in this cell, but if the agent is at some point in, in this level, so the minimum amount of the, uh, on the account, if in this state the agent withdraw funds, then it goes to bankruptcy. So this is not uh, a desirable outcome, it's actually a highly undesirable outcome and we penalize it uh, by a big penalty for this. So whenever agent is uh, in any uh, of these cells and moves downward, it incurs a negative penalty of minus 100. 
Now, in all other cases, uh, uh, if the agent does nothing, so moves along, uh, it doesn't incur any cost, but any other actions like adding uh, to the account, which would result to this move, or withdrawing from the amount, which would result in this move, will incur a cost of 10 bucks, right? So the, uh, the, the, the task of the agent is to maintain, because of that, the agent has to maintain the minimum amount possible and then withdraw all funds. So, so the optimal trajectory is extremely simple and it involves only two actions. First, uh, initially the agent deposit money and then does nothing at all and then withdraw money. That's it, right? Uh, so very simple optimal strategy to learn. Uh, uh, like the human, it would take probably one or two repetitions at most. You just tell a human don't overdraw and that's it. But you can't tell this to the agent. You have to show the agent what to do. And the way to show is to generate a bunch of trajectories uh, and, and learn from those trajectories, right? But the interesting point is that even though the problem is so simple as literally as I described, it, it still takes around, like if you look at this graph here, it shows the results of training using two most famous algorithms from reinforcement learning. One is called SARSA, another one is called Q learning, uh, what you can see here is that it takes about 300 uh, episodes uh, to learn uh, uh, policy which is close to optimal policy. So if it takes 300 steps, even in this simplest problem, right, which has nothing essentially, no statisticity, no nothing, uh, you can imagine, just imagine how many repetitions it will take in more realistic cases. Uh, but fortunately, not too many. We have examples from option pricing in which, uh, which is like much more realistic, much more close to the reality. And in that case, like you, you might uh, get along with something like uh, 50,000 uh, uh, samples or, or, or pretty low number of uh, episodes as well. All right. So, so this was an illustration of how reinforcement learning works. And we also illustrate how inverse reinforcement learning works using the same setting. So you can use the same formulation uh, and uh, generate a bunch of trajectories um, uh, 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 from, um, uh, from this environment and then uh, learn uh, the, the optimal policy from these trajectories. And there are actually number of algorithms that uh, you can use for this task. There is one very important point uh, to, to keep in mind here that I, 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 I can't, for the lack of time, I can't go into details of how these algorithms work. Uh, but uh, one of the assumptions there is that, uh, is that uh, uh, many of these algorithms, including, for example, this one, maximum entropy inverse reinforcement learning, which is one of the most popular ones, uh, the assumption there is that the data collected uh, 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 assumes that uh, all actions are either uh, optimal or sufficiently close to optimal. So the data uh, is assumed to be nearly optimal in terms of the policy. And clearly it's not always the case. And moreover, in some applications, it's not even uh, obvious what, should, what data is optimal and which is, which, what data is not. Uh, uh, so, uh, there are other algorithms which do not make these uh, uh, restrictive assumptions. And there is one which is uh, one of my favorite ones. It's called T-Rex, which stands for Trajectory Based Extrapolation. And this algorithm learns the intent of the agent uh, uh, rather than received rewards. These are not the same. Uh, this is not the same. And intent or intent is in some ways uh, preferred. Uh, to learn in the actual rewards. So in the book, we have examples of how different algorithms perform here. Uh, for the lack of time, I will not go into explanations here. If you have questions, we can uh, re uh, come back to this. Uh, but the conclusion uh, which you can draw from these experiments in this uh, particular environment is that T-Rex works indeed better. Uh, it does not uncover the whole uh, ground truth uh, and uh, it's something that probably is uh, intuitive enough. You cannot uncover the whole truth because this is some sort of ill-posed problem. Uh, 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 
but but it does uncover some elements of the truth. For example, uh, the high value of this state. Uh, this state has high value because from that state you can directly go to that state uh, uh, where you get the maximum reward. All right, uh, skipping this part, I just want to very briefly, I, I believe I have something like five minutes left, uh, something like that. Um, I want to talk about uh, some uh, more interesting applications which are uh, closer to real life. Uh, and so one of them is uh, described in our uh, uh, book uh, and also in the original paper, which you can find on SSRN.com, for example. And uh, these are more uh, kind of serious and more interesting algorithms for reverse, uh, re reinforcement learning and inverse reinforcement learning, which we call G-Learner and GIRL. So G-Learner is the algorithm for direct reinforcement learning. Uh, and uh, uh, all this is done for the tasks of uh, wealth management. Uh, wealth management and portfolio optimization, uh, which I see as pretty much related task, very close uh, to each other. Uh, in terms of uh, methodologies. Uh, so, but the implication, uh, the, the applications that we had in mind for this was the, for wealth management, for retirement planning, uh, uh, problems like that. Uh, so, G-Learning works for the direct problem of optimization of the policy, uh, and uh, it's based on uh, uh, RL approach, which is called G-Learning. Um, uh, which uh, is itself uh, some sort of a probabilistic extension of uh, Q-learning, which is one of the uh, most famous uh, RL algorithms. And in particular, that's the one which was used by uh, DeepMind uh, for Atari video games. Uh, I'll skip the explanation of what uh, either of them do, but just give you kind of high-level ideas. Uh, now, um, so in our model, in our approach, G-learning is a very general approach. It can work in, in uh, either in those semi-analytical formulations, which I had in mind, which I mentioned before, or it can work in full-blown, uh, non-parametric uh, setting based on neural nets. Uh, but in our case, we used very simple uh, uh, reward function, uh, which was made on a uh, few parameters, only four parameters in total. Uh, and the, the idea of this parameter, uh, of, those, uh, of this reward function, was that you have to have something which uh, tries to catch up with some sort of a running goal. And this running goal is a combination uh, of uh, some sort of a benchmark uh, index portfolio. Uh, and your current portfolio, uh, so it's a linear combination of them taken with some weight or uh, of this benchmark and your portfolio, which grows with some factor eta. Uh, now, uh, so this gives you two parameters of the model. And also there are two other parameters, which is the risk aversion and the trading cost. So you, in all in total, we have only four parameters to learn, uh, which is simple enough. Uh, now, uh, I mean, uh, these are four parameters in the reward function. Uh, but if you use, uh, if you use, uh, so we have another algorithm called G uh, Girl, which stands for uh, G learning based inverse reinforcement learning. Uh, here, uh, which works in, in 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 pair with the with the G learning algorithm in, in the sense that. Uh, you can use a uh, girl in order to uh, infer parameters of the reward function, these four parameters, rho, eta, omega, and lambda, from, uh, from the observed behavior, right? So now this observed behavior can be uh, just behavior of human investors, uh, but uh, for the purpose of benchmarking and testing, uh, uh, it can also be a behavior generated by the G-learner agent. Uh, and that's exactly what we did in, in the test. So this is just uh, some uh, example, uh, some, some pages from the book, which talks about this formulation. And uh, in the paper, in the book, we also show the uh, results of uh, uh, simple experiments in controlled simulated environment that show uh, how this thing performs. Uh, and uh, and uh, uh, in, in, at least in our setting, we, we, we found that actually uh, the performance is promising in the sense that for uh, direct reinforcement learning, 
we do see these numbers are sharp ratios. So these are not, they are not very impressive, uh, obviously, uh, but uh, what matters here is the difference between this number and that number. And this difference is what uh, reinforcement learning brings you here. So increase of uh, about 20% in sharp ratio uh, is obtained as a result of acting uh, optimally uh, by the agent uh, and adjusting, digesting the information about uh, the environment which agents receives uh, through actually uh, this thing, through uh, information about the expected reward. So the agent uses the a model for expected reward, which is actually shown here, uh, while the actual rewards, uh, sorry, actual returns are shown here. You see that there is not much resemblance between these two things, except for small, some sort of a small uh, uh, correlation. So expected reward uh, returns uh, in blue uh, here are weakly correlated with realized returns. Uh, this is what we did here by design in this simulated environment, but that's actually how things work in practice. So if you have a model, typically uh, this model of returns is, is, is a weak predictor. It doesn't work really well, but nevertheless, uh, the small amount of ground truth that it captures is already enough to, to get this increase in the performance. So this is for a direct task, and, and there is also uh, inverse reinforcement learning, which is uh, this line here. Uh, and what it shows is that this number is almost the same as this number. It shows that, at least in this case, uh, we, will, we managed to, to back up uh, parameters of the original reward without knowing them, just from observing the behavior. And this is how we uh, calibrate uh, this second model goal. And then we use this model in order to replicate the first trade. So you see the, the, the idea here is that these two algorithms can uh, uh, work in tandem. Uh, so this is uh, G-Learner uh, and this is Go. Um, and uh, they can be used, for example, in robo-advising. Uh, they can be used in order to first model uh, actual agents as, uh, as uh, G-Learner agents and then replicating them, mimicking them using the second algorithm. So here's the uh, reference uh, to the paper. And finally, in the next uh, uh, minute or so, I want just to mention uh, other applications. So there are other very interesting applications of inverse reinforcement learning. And one of them has to do with the idea of modeling the market as a whole, as some sort of an agent. Uh, and this uh, links back to uh, you know, very popular idea or other set of ideas uh, which talk about some sort of invisible hand in the market. And we can think of this invisible hand as some sort of collective wisdom of all market participants, uh, which we aggregate into some sort of a super agent. So if this is super agent, if the whole market is a super agent, then we can ask the question, like, what are the preferences of this super agent? What is its utility function? And if we formulate the problem in this way, we can apply methods of inverse reinforcement learning to, to learn the reward function of this agent. And once we do that, we can convert it into some views of market dynamics implied by this inferred view. Uh, 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 of, 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 of how it works, uh, taken from this inverse reinforcement learning perspective. And there is a, a, a paper uh, which we have on SSRN with uh, details, and also a, a little bit more digestible formulation is presented in our book. Uh, so again, because I started with the book, I want to uh, end with the book as well. Uh, so by uh, by showing you like what is uh, what else is there. So we have introduction to reinforcement learning, chapter nine, and then we have uh, we cover uh, different applications of reinforcement learning for trading. Some of them I mentioned already uh, today. Some I did not. Uh, I briefly mentioned option pricing, uh, applications to portfolio optimization, wealth management, etc. Uh, also a very long chapter on inverse reinforcement learning, which I only very lightly touched uh, in this presentation and uh, for those of you who like physics as myself uh, there is also the final chapter 
uh, uh, about frontiers, which talk about many different and exciting links uh, between reinforcement learning and inverse reinforcement learning and physics. Uh, and on this, I, I, I would like to, to stop and maybe take questions if any. Thank you very much.